podcast like this. Check it, check it, check it. It's Unique Hustle. It's your boy ECEO, and I'm here with the lovely, amazing, official Miss Jamaica. What's going on, man? Not none, you know, my day walk on. Man. But y'all don't forget to like and subscribe and follow us on all social media platforms, okay? We got you. Man, she want them likes and subscribes, huh? Yes, hey, sir. man, we got a guy in here today, y'all. He really don't need no introduction, man. This guy right here, man, I've been watching him really for a very, very, very long time. I How always- long? Man, I can go back because cause he was on Apollo. He was on a lot of different stuff. But you make him sound older. He's not that old. Well, he old enough to, he done been in them same rooms where I, uh, Steve Harvey and all them other folks come through. And I've been watching them the same way. We all got this gray going now. Oh, okay. So we doing our thing. Let us live. You know, we just look better than them old niggas you used to know, man. <laughs> Check it, man. Shuck it, duck it, shuck it, duck it. Quack, quack is in the building. Quack, quack back. <laughs> <laughs> man, how you doing, brother? I'm doing good. Man, it's a good thing, man, when you can sit down with uh, brothers that, you know, that you know paid away and, and created the history and the vibe for, you know, comedy, even in the Dallas market for show. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I see you, uh, I be just checking out everything. And I'm going to get into some detail, but I know how you be rolling. So I'm going to pull up for a second. Yeah, because like, <laughs> I'm going to go all the way in. For me, I don't always know because he, he said, you know, everybody know you, but I didn't know you before now, before he introduced me to you. So I need to know your upbringing. I need to know where you're from. Are you born and raised here? Yes, I'm born and raised in Dallas, Texas, Oak Cliff. Really? Oak Cliff, down in the bottom, it's off of 8th Street, where uh, first we lived in South Dallas, which mm-hmm. is over there in Colonial. That was my first elementary school in Colonial. Then uh, we, uh, I'll take that about, you know, first semester, then the second semester, we moved over into Oak Cliff, mm. whereas N.W. Harley, whereas the, the school was named after uh, a black man. Mm. And uh, Describe so, Oak Cliff back then compared to the Oak Cliff that we know now. Oak Cliff was fun. It was, it was a lot of fun, you know. Uh, pe- the families were more close together. Everybody was some kin to somebody. Mm-hmm. If they don't, they didn't have a baby by this person and married that person and all that kind of stuff. So it was it was a, it was a real tight knit. Everybody knew each other. On so the it was more about family. It wasn't about like when people when I first came here and I hear about Oak Cliff, they made it sound like it was bad. It was the ghetto. It was this. It was that. So. Well, that didn't come in to the eighties. That, okay. that came in the eighties when the crack epidemic came in, and mm-hmm. uh, and the parents started moving. Uh, to the suburbs, so leaving the houses, you know, vacant, and mm-hmm. then giving them to the kids or the grandkids. And the grandkids, they didn't when they got their it. got their education and they want to stay in the hood, they want to say, "I'm moving on up, like the uh. Jeffersons." <laughs> and so, uh, so it, it started degrading when that crack epidemic came in. Oh, okay, so were you raised with siblings? Yes, I'm the oldest of six kids. My, six kids. Oh yeah, my oldest. I'm the oldest. Uh, my mom had six kids. I said, my mom had six kids before she was 22. <laughs> No, she didn't. I said the same thing. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> I said, she has some more kids. I'm going to tie her too. <laughs> so, did she have the six kids with your dad? Oh, uh, you know, you're getting real personal. Now. I, you know I like you. to get down, down in there. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I, you know, I was I was born out of wedlock. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, then the other two was, uh, one, the other, my brother came, he was out of wedlock. Then she married uh, my sister, who who was born, he, he my, we dad, him. That's so was your I daddy carry. in your life? I didn't get it to meet him until I was like 19. I was really graduated. Boy, he said one time I, my mama uh, had me to meet him at a, a parking garage. Say, this is your daddy. He said, boy, I've been looking all over for you. I said, well, you didn't look too hard because I was right down the street. <laughs> <laughs> so he lived in the same area. Yeah, he lived in the same area. Wow. And he was a very popular guy, but I didn't know him as So I was you didn't know up. who he was. I didn't know who so he was. So you never asked your mom, like, Mom, where's my dad? Who is my dad? Did you did she tell you that the father figure that you had in the household was not your father? Uh uh-uh. uh, no, 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 no. It, the rumors around in the family mm-hmm. we knew. Okay. Now somebody said we had a lady named Ed Lee. She was one of them nosy neighbors. Mm. I mean, she, uh, Ms. She, Kravitz. Dress Ms. Kravitz. She <laughs> told me she made tell everybody business. Everybody, <laughs> you wanna, and she would say, you know, that ain't your daddy. You know, all that kind of stuff. And then, uh, you know, she said my daddy was Al T&T Brad. Mm. Al T&T Brad was a blues singer. Mm. And he, had, he was on KKDA radio and all that type of stuff. So he said that was my dad. And so, when they said that was my dad, did you look him up and like I don't no, know nothing like no, him? No, uh, you know they had a they had a television show on Channel Eleven mm-hmm. back in the day called Operation Soul. Okay, and Al T and T Brad would be on Operation Soul, 
And then so when Miss uh, when Miss Kravitz, I'm gonna call Miss mm-hmm, Kravitz. Miss mm-hmm. Kravitz said that that's my dad. That's your dad. I start singing. Mm. I start singing. Mm. I, I start singing like Al T and D Brad. See, you know, James you. now. James Brown was my idol for right. as you know, want to be an entertainer. Uh huh. But when she said uh, Al T and D Brad with my daddy, boy, I was I was, <laughs> I was writing songs. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't spell what the quarter, but I was writing some. I was writing the hell out of some songs. So how did you feel the first time you met him at nineteen? What other than you telling him that you were just down the street? How did that feel to you? Well, I was overwhelmed because you want to you want to meet your biological father, right? And so I was overwhelmed by seeing him, and then he, he, when he saw me, he said, "Because uh, he had another son mm-hmm. named Carl," and he said, "He looked just like Carl, don't he? He looked just like Carl." And you didn't know and who he, that was. I didn't know who Carl was. He sounded just like Carl, and then so. I got a chance to go over to his house, mm-hmm. meet my grandmother, and uh, I met her. My grandmother now, my grandmother was married to, you know, uh, uh, Burrell, Burrell's Barbecue. It was a big. Uh, Where is that at? It was in. It was used to be on the show here on A Street back in the day, uh, but it was it was Burrell Barbecue, uh, and it. They, they, yeah. they had one on Cedar Crest, but you, I don't know if y'all familiar with Dallas, but that was yeah. that was my, my my grandmother had married him. Oh, yeah. So you so you had a popular family. I but I didn't know it. I mean, I can't you know because we was my mom was single parent mm-hmm. and she was struggling all these times. So I didn't uh, like I said I didn't meet him till I was nineteen. You know, so eighteen to nineteen, I, I didn't meet him mm-hmm. to then, and then so I just started hanging around with him for a little period, short period of time. You build that relationship. I build, you know, because he was one thing I liked about my dad was he was a hustler. Mm. He could make, he, he, you know, he can create his own jobs. Mm-hmm. That's what I liked about him. Mm-hmm. He created his own. Wow, well, um, you know, being in Dallas comedy. When I think back to what I my history of thinking. I remember when Steve Harvey then was doing them nightclubs and you know what I'm saying, was doing the comedy movement here. Did you link with them during that time? Yeah, yeah, I look, uh, I, well, in 91, I had quit my job as a bus driver. Okay. And moved to LA to try to make it in LA. Now there's a whole backstory behind that. And but, then so everything didn't go as I wanted to go in LA. I didn't like the, the vibe, sort of say. How old was you at that time? I can't think how old I was. I'm sure. I know Rodney King got beat. Doing okay, that, okay, <laughs> that that's good. Yeah, I, I, I talk I, about those times. I, but I, was, exactly. I was still. I was in my thirties. I, okay. I was. I was. I was in. I was in my thirties. And you had had you been on the stage already before you went up there? Well, I, see, it's a it's a long story. Let's get in that long story. A, I need to hear it's that a long, too. It's a long story. Um, uh, how can I tell the story? You got to you got to take me back. I got to take you way back. Yeah. You want to go way back? Yeah. See, well, if I have to take you way back, is back in 1981. Okay. I, I met this lady where I was working at a uh, grocery store. Okay. And she introduced me to Buddhism. Whoa. Yeah. She was a Buddhist. See, because see, I wanted to be uh, 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 a preacher. But, but let, me, let, me, let, me, let me go back to this. Let me tell you like this is. When I met my father, my father was like a hustler. I mean, he did a whole lot of different things. My father did a whole bunch of different things. You, you met your father, and this is look, when you met that lady with the Buddhism? No, 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 no. I'm, I'll say, okay, I met my father. I'm just, I'll, I'll say it like this, okay. I met my father when I was 18 to 19 years old. Okay. Okay, and then he introduced me to my half-brother, which is Carl. Okay. Carl was a partying person. He did a lot of parties and things of that nature. So he did a whole bunch of parties. And so uh, uh, so I'm trying to connect with my father. Now I'm trying to connect with my, ha- my half-brother, brother. things of that nature. So he, when he first met me, he kind of looked me up and down, you know, you know, like, uh, you know, you know, big, I wasn't no big deal, or, you know, you know, and all that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he was real popular because the girls knew him because he went to South Oak Cliff High School. He was real popular with the girls and he was real popular with partying then so he had a partner and him and his partner fell out over a car okay uh and so so he no longer had no partner at this time i was washing buses for uh for the dallas transit system i was uh, cleaning buses, cleaning and, buses things like yeah. and then so um so he had no partner and so i'm trying to connect 
and be with him, you know, get to get to know my half brother and everything, you know, because he now he partying and he got the girls. I don't, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be around him. So I told him I go in business with you. Uh -huh. I, I'll go in business. You know, I had the job, so we went and started getting turntables and uh, getting records and uh, mixers and all this in Oak Cliff. All this in Oak Cliff. We started doing all that stuff together. We started putting parties together. Man, we put party. He showed me how to go get the building, how to get the flyers, how to get out there, and, you know, make it happen. And we used to be ball. We used to sell out. Wow, partying. That's around. I remember one club. I remember back in the days, players. That was a long time. Oh, ago. that was on Carol, Carol, Carol and Ross yeah. over there. Yeah, Carol. stuff like yeah. that. Like this. There, I'm just trying to go back. R, R J by the lake and all that. Oh yeah, by the lake. Yes, Bob yeah. went over there by the lake, yeah. the, the Northwest Highway. And y'all was over no cliff with it. We was over no cliff, but see, that's a whole different. Those are whole new different uh, uh, vibe. The Vibes. party, the party and scene was totally different. Like we would get hotels and do the party. Okay, got we it. Go, we go, we go, we rent out the hotel ballrooms. And, and that's how we did the uh, uh, party thing. Then one time we rented it out and two guys got into it with a fight and all that type of wow. stuff. So they kind of like slowed that down, uh, you know, for a little bit. For a little bit. For, for, for a little bit. But then and again, I was partying because I wasn't a popular guy in school. I went to Roosevelt. I went to high, Franklin D. Roosevelt. Yeah. But I wasn't a popular guy in school. I was just like the average guy in school, a uh, ugly guy. Yeah, yeah, girls yeah. Girls paid no attention to and all that kind of stuff. But then when I got hooked up with my brother, then everything started opening up where women started coming to me or girls started coming to me because now I'm, I'm, I'm popular. I'm with, my, I'm with a popular brother and uh, we're doing these parties. So, what was your name during that time? Cecil, Cecil Armstrong. Okay, you, they just knew you as Cecil Armstrong. Cecil Armstrong. It was yeah. just Cecil Armstrong. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then so I wasn't used to, I mean, I got used to this thing. It was good. It was going fast. But something just wasn't right. My spirit wasn't right, so to say. So in 1979, okay. uh, 78, 79, I told my brother, I said, man, I'm going to give up the party and thing. I'm going to let you have the party and thing. I'm going to get in church. Wow. I'm going to go to church. So, uh, you know, I wanted to get to the bottom of what life was and what life was all about. What what um, what inspired you to even? It was it just because you got tired of going through that type of lifestyle, or you seen somebody that said something to you, or was it just something that was inside of you that said, "I want to start changing my ways"? No, I uh, I grew up in the church. I grew okay, up in church. Okay, okay, I get Christ. it. I grew up in the church. I always the, the, I, all we knew was church. I was <laughs> we had a little uh, quartet singing. Uh, so I grew up in the church, and that's all I knew. And so now, after being denied these girls and this attention for so long, now I'm getting the attention. The church feeling came in. Okay. Mm. So I say, God, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go back to church. But I wanted to get to the bottom of what life is and what life was really all about. You know, because I always thinking about black people always at the bottom. Why are we always Man. at the bottom? And Why? how old were you when this was when? Well, that was in I was about I was about a uh, twenty something, about twenty maybe twenty four. Okay, 20, young, 23, soul searching. Yeah, twenty three, twenty four, something okay. in that area. And uh, so uh, uh, I just say we we at the bottom. Why are we at the bottom? And the the thing is, I could find out by going to church. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna start at church. I say white people is is the beginning of civilization and all that type of stuff. Where did we That's come from? Thought, thought That's about. the way I thought. Where do we come from? What do we do? Bam! So I went and got into church, and uh, Church of God in Christ, and Church of God in Christ to me was kind of a little backwards on certain different things. Mm -hmm. They were real, real strict, you mm -hmm. know. But we jammed, though. <laughs> I played drums in the church, but we jammed and everything. And then so I left there, and I got into the Baptist church. Did you get your answers, though? Well, it's, it was a long journey. It just stop. I went to the Baptist church, and the Baptist church you could do almost anything. You you know, mm -hmm. you know, just as long as you on Sunday, you all right. You know, you can you can smoke behind the pool pit. I'm not not behind the pool, but I'm not behind the pool. <laughs> behind the building, but you can have behind the building and stuff like that. Just you can get away with a lot of different things okay. where you you know couldn't get at Church of God in Christ, mm -hmm. you know, and all that type of stuff. But also, what at at the Baptist church, I was able to get my license. To be a preacher, mm. because so we you know we are uh, uh, we admired uh, preachers, you know. So I, I just don't want to be just a member in the church. I want to be something. Ordained. I want to be. I don't say about ordained. I got my license. I guess. I guess. <laughs> I guess he played sprinkle some water on me and stuff <laughs> like that. But then and again, because I was in the church and I had just came from the partying part, I wasn't used to just being idle. Mm -hmm. So I started a radio uh, uh, show 
called Half Hour of Gospel Power on KSKY radio right. station 660 on your AM dial. Hey, I started that and uh, I was doing. Uh, I did that for about a year, I think. Uh, doing thing, I was the first one to bring the Winans, the Winans, uh, the album. We went to uh, uh, Andre Crouch's house. Uh, they had the James Cleveland workshop. I went up there. They had the went to uh, Andre Crouch was introducing the Winans to the public. And they came out with that uh, hit song called The Question Is. Hey. And so uh, I got that album, brought it back to, uh, to Dallas, and put it on my radio show, and it was a, it was a hit. You know? Wow. So how do you get linked to a lady that is practicing Buddhism? I told you, it's a long journey. I'm mm -hmm. telling you. So, so I was doing uh, uh, the Buddhism, and also I said, I was, since I'm going to be in church, you know, I'm going to need me a woman, because I know I need me as a woman. So I married... Uh, 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 a, a young lady. I married her, and uh, that marriage lasted by one year. Mm. Yeah. You know, we last, last by one year. And you were a minister at this time? No, I wasn't really a minister. Just say I was wanted to be a minister. Okay. Because I ain't do them but three sermons. Oh, okay. I find three sermons, I know I ain't going to be no preacher. <laughs> <laughs> I know I ain't going to be no preacher after three sermons. You know, so, uh, uh, so, but we had separated and then so I was going through, that was in 78, 79, okay, and she got pregnant, we had our child and everything. So it was just about a year. Just lasted about a year. Mm -hmm. And then so, uh, uh, I was just going through, you know, separated, trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Uh, it was just you know you're just trying to you know just trying to find yourself. So I left I left uh, Dallas. I left Dallas. I was working at the uh, grocery store. Like I tell you, this lady came out of the grocery store. A Japanese lady came out of the grocery store and say, oh, "Are you happy?" Mm. I said, "Yeah, I'm happy. I'm sure I'm happy." You know, but I was uh, laughing on the outside, but crying on the inside because mm -hmm. I'm going through this separation. Don't know what I want to do, you know, you know, and everything. She said, "Oh, I want to introduce you to something." I said, "Okay." So she came and picked me up, and we went to Irving, and was in this. Uh, and you've never met her before. I never met her before, mm -hmm. and uh, so we went to Irving, and they was in this room. Different nationalities was in this room. It had a scroll, and they was chanting "Nam Yo Ho Ringe Kyo," mm -hmm. "Nam Yo Ho Ringe Kyo." You know, I dedicate my life to the universal law of cause and effect through sound. That's, that's what it meant. That's what it meant. I never knew what it meant. I've always heard, it, all heard time. it, but I never knew the meaning. Say it again. I dedicate my life to the universal. Well, no, what did I say? It? Yeah, Nam Yo Ho Ringe Kyo. Tina Turner was practicing. Yeah, Tina Turner was practicing on that. I see that movies too. Yeah, yeah, she sure did. So, uh, uh, so I was lacking the vibe, but this time I was going through. Like I said, I was going through. But I had a sister in Chicago, and uh, I had put some resumes out to work for a radio station because I did the KSKY thing. Wow. So I'm gonna say, let me make my career be in, in radio. And then so uh, uh, they called me back and said I can come to Chicago and make do radio sales in Chicago. And so that when she introduced me in 1980, in the 80 or 81, 81. 80, I went to uh, Chicago. I left Dallas and Chicago and signed up and I started practicing Buddhism for eight years. Mm. Wow. For eight you years. stuck with that for eight, for eight years. For eight years. How because you, the discipline that they I gave I was you. just about to see It was why. the discipline uh, uh, that you that you really enjoyed about them is because you had to have that, that, that fighting spirit. Hey! You know, when they tell you to do something, hey! You got to go to it. Mm. You got to sit down and make stuff uh, happen. When we bring in uh, dignitaries, from the uh, from the set, we're bringing them in, and we have to set up things like we're doing a presidential uh, election or a presidential mm. campaign, where we have to go have we have a control center, we have a person here got to do this, a person got to do that. We have different chores we have to do. We had to sleep in the community center to as the security guards or the protection for the for the Gahanzan. Wow! And when I think about Buddha, I'm thinking about people would have to shave their heads. That, no, that's so that's good. not. No, there used to be a certain set they have to do that. We was, Those we, are more like priests. We, what I find out that the set that I was practicing right. is like the Jehovah Witnesses of Buddhism. Oh. <laughs> so when you, how did you end up, and I, I don't want to go too fast, but how did you end up getting out of it? Right. How did you what end you mean up, get out of it? How did you end also up? I wasn't still, like, I wasn't no crippled No, you blood. said eight years, <laughs> you only did it for eight years. So I did eight years. You only because practiced it for was, eight years. Yeah, but I was on the search. I'm still, I said what I said, I want to get to the bottom of the truth, what mm -hmm. life is and what life was, uh, was about. Well, I did it eight years, 
then I started uh, when I started the comedy thing. When I started the comedy thing, it led me to a lot of different mm -hmm. stuff. To the Third Eye Conference, where I started learning about Afrocentric and uh, the, the pyramids, and so I got, I got a chance to meet Dr. John Henry Clark. So, is that the reason why you stopped doing practicing? Um, why you stepped out of Buddhism? Like at the end of the eight years, why did you say, "Okay, this is not for me. Let me keep on this search"? Well, what I found out. I really didn't like organized religion, so to say. Mm. And what I've started finding out is it became too like, I, I, it became like, I want to dress like a Japanese. I want to eat this, you know. And I said, what about my culture? Mm. What about black people? Because I'm trying to get to the bottom. It seemed like every time a culture that's on top Seem like black people mimic those people. Mm. It's because we have no confidence within ourselves. I agree with that. You know, and so I, I start getting myself concerned with that. Okay, so I went into, like I said, Afrocentric. I went to went to Chicago, uh, practiced there. Uh, I lost my job. I mean, they told me to give me three week, three months to get myself together as a salesperson at the radio station. Well, I didn't make a sale in a month, <laughs> and they let me go. And so I'm sitting there, I'm 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 sitting there trying to get a, 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 a figuring out what I'm going to do. So what I did is I had a little money left. I got me a, a, a got me a, a some Amaral, some dishwashing liquid liquid, and a, and a brush. And this a guy had a service station sitting on the corner of 51st and Cornell. So I went to him and said, hey, man, y'all, they, 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 they had a service station. They had a mechanic shop in there. So I said, hey, man, uh, don't y'all need these cars clean when the, uh, uh, when they get through service? And I don't even want to turn them into a no-dirty car. He, he said, uh, yeah, we can do that. I said, well, I want, can I do that service? Said, yeah, I'm gonna try, I'll give y'all uh, $5. Every, every third car, y'all get five. I get 10. First two cars is mine. The third car is yours. That's the way we did it. Wow. And I made, I made me some money. So how do you end up on the stage doing comedy? It's a process, mm -hmm. I tell you. So, so the, the, the service at Chicago wasn't working out. You know, my, my, my sister found out I had made my money and I had stacked it. So next thing you know, she wanted some money. You know, kept on, I said, well, let me get me a plane ticket and get up out of here because I'm gonna be broke, you know, dealing with, you know, cause every time Family. she finally find mm -hmm. I got some money, she gonna, you know. She, 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 she was in gonna, Chicago? Or yeah, she, she was in Chicago. Yeah, so you like, so, so Southside? So yeah, so I said, Hard, Hyde Park, over okay. there where Obama was from. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I said, let me get my money. So I came back to Dallas in 81 and uh, uh, started a car wash business in Dallas. And, you know, it was kind of like, it was different than Chicago. Chicago kind of close, Dallas is kind of spread out. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of like working, but it, it wasn't working and things of that nature. So what I did was went around uh, some bo painting body shops. I went around painting body shops and asked them, do they need the cars clean, you know, to have cert certain things. Well, this guy had a car where a woman, where somebody threw a brick over a bridge and killed the woman in the car and had blood and stuff and everything else. They huh? needed somebody to clean that car. And so I took that job on the cleaning that car and I did it so well, um, they kept on finding me other works to do, work to do. So I called body shops doing the work, doing the work. And then I came up on a, a body shop that was real, doing real good, very organized, and they have an inside wash person. And they needed an inside wash person. And I took that job. So I took that job, and then at the meantime, I was going around the club, you know, because I had another friend named Hoagie, who, who's a, a DJ, and he was doing a lot of different things, and he had a band. And so I was hanging around with him, and I'd be in the club, and I'd be saying, oh, shucka ducky. I just said it, you know, it was just a phrase that I said all the time. Uh, Where did you get the phrase from? I just don't know, it's just something that I said all the time. You know, I, if a girl go, to, if I see a, a, a girl coming with some gossip, I said, oh, shucka duck. So and would then, uh, people say you are the originator of that phrase? I am the originator of that phrase. Okay, just check I, it. I am, I am the originator of the phrase, but I can't tell you, I just go say, put this together and put this together and say it came that way. Mm. All I can say that I'm saying the phrase, I'm saying shucka duck. That's all okay. I'm saying. Oh, shuck it, duck. It's just an 
uh, I could have got it from Suki Suki now or something. I don't know how. I but, got you. But I just okay. said it. Oh, shucky ducky. Mm. Uh, and then so, uh, uh, and then I see a, a fine girl say, oh, shucky ducky. Mm-hmm. And the ladies would laugh. The ladies, I mean, the automatic laughs. But I didn't think this was in eighty one, so I didn't really think anything about uh, think about, think about all about that. And then so uh, so I went on and went on, and I was uh, the car wash thing. I was getting tired of washing these cars, so I used to work for a hospital, and so I uh, went back <coughs> went back to them and started working for this uh, this hospital in uh, eighty about eighty two, about eighty two. I started working for the uh, for the hospital. And so after I did the, in the hospital for a little while, I got tired of uh, uh, I got you know got I got a little bit tired of it, of, of, you know just washing pots and pans and things of that nature. I want to do something big, so I did the hospital thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, but in 1984, practicing Buddhism, mm-hmm. we wanted to go to Japan to, to Mount Fuji to see the te- to go be in the Grand Temple. Mm-hmm. Okay, I didn't have any money. During this time, the phrase "Where's the beef?" was real popular, mm. with uh, Jesse Jackson running for president of the United States. Gary Hart and Mondale also was running for president of the United States. Gary Hart got in something with Donna Rice or some sort like that, uh, and he was talking. And so they was talking this campaign debate about policies and and. Uh, uh, Gary Hart had an economic policy that he was trying to present, and and so Mondale's say, uh, "Where is the beef?" You know, because the, the, that phrase was real popular. I said, "Well, okay, that phrase is real popular. Shoot, I can make me some T-shirts. Where is the beef? And sell them T-shirts and make me that three thousand dollars. I need to go to Japan." Mm-hmm. And uh, and you did. Well, I I I, I what well, somebody told me I couldn't do it because it when, phrase belongs to, belongs to uh, Wendy's. Right. But see, I was reading a newspaper article. And I saw the people that did the campaign for it, and I called the advertising agency in New York. The advertising agency told me to call Wendy's International. Mm-hmm. And then Wendy's International told me to call Pro Sports, who had the license agreement to sell Where's the Beef t-shirts across the country. Mm-hmm. And so I signed with them. They sent me down the, the, the promotional package. Where they had t-shirts in there, they had mugs. They had bumper stickers, and then they said they're gonna come out with a country and western song called "Where's the Beef." I said, "Wow!" And then so Clara, the old woman, got in trouble with Wendy's for doing a spaghetti commercial using that phrase in a mm-hmm. spaghetti commercial. Mm. Then she turned around and without died without permission. Without permission, right? Because you got permission. Yeah, well, I had got permission. I had right. a, and then I had a, got a contract to, right. s- to sell exactly. And then so when she did that, then uh, the whole campaign kind of like died down. Mm. And then so I didn't have nothing to do. That was in 84. Then in 85, my friend, Hoagie, that did the band and did GJing, he wrote a rap record called Get Live in 85. Mm-hmm. And so I put all my money behind promoting him. We had mm-hmm. the records printed up. Uh, we went to different clubs. We, we, you know, That was our promotion. That was my promotion. I said, I'm going to stick behind. I had posters and everything. And so I said, well, man, we got to hear up because at the end of 85, ain't nothing, you know, ain't nothing else happening. Okay. And so, so we worked that campaign until December, and then, then when December came along, we sit down, and we start talking about what we're going to do for '86. Mm-hmm. And then Hogan said, "Well, I'm gonna come up with in the mix in '86." Mm. I said, "Okay, I tell you what, y'all do the in the mix in '86." I said, "I'm gonna do this shucky ducky thing. I think I think this phrase can work. I'm gonna take this whole concept from where to be because they sent me down this promotional right. package. So I'm just going by what they did on the promotional package." I said, "Well, Hogan, since you a rapper, write that song. Write me a shucky ducky theme song." Then I say, uh, the guy that was practicing Buddhism was a graphic artist. I say, hey man, won't you write Make me, me uh, a, a logo for with a shucky ducky? I said, since I'm, since I'm a bus driver, put that salute in there because every bus driver salute itself. Mm-hmm. Can I wear glasses? So I said, I put the glasses on and the thing. Like, so he did that. Then I had another friend of mine who was a dancer. She came up with a shucky ducky dance. I still can't do it today. <laughs> I, don't I don't know what kind of dance that was. And then so while they was doing all that together, I had start uh, got a hotel so I can do me a big party and this was during the March Madness of mm-hmm. 1986 there's the March Madness that's when it, it happened during the March Madness in 86 and so I was dating this girl and uh, she called me and she said uh, 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 what do shucky ducky mean anyway 
And my mama say, instead of cursing or still saying shit, say shucky ducky. Uh, okay? okay, I said, yeah. And then, so my mom is a type of person who like to look up words. Mm -hmm. So we looked up the words. We looked shucky up, and ducky. Right. Okay. We looked up the word shucks. Shucks is a slang word that expresses. Oh, shucks. Yeah. yeah it is, it's a slang word that expresses disappointment. Oh, okay. Okay. Ducky. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> ducky is an Irish term or Irish phrase that expresses excitement, mm. pleasure. So they're like almost total opposite. Totally opposite. And then so uh, so me and my mom put the definition together. We say, okay. hey, shucky ducky could be a phrase that means disappointment or excitement. Instead of cursing when you stump your toe, you say shucky ducky. Mm. If you see a fine girl or guy you like, you say, oh, shucky ducky. ducky. <laughs> it's hot, new, and fun to say you shucky ducky in your vocabulary today. We had 10,000 flyers printed up in 1986, and every concert that came to Dallas, I was passing them out with that, with that definition on it and the phrase. Passing it out. And that was there before the comedy, before everything. Before the comedy. Before the comedy. And then I said, you okay. You just selling the phrase before people selling, was even doing all of phrase. that. Okay. I got with me an entertainment lawyer. We named Jasper Rowe. Mm -hmm. And we did the copyrights to it. Then we turned around and did the trademark to it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, um, we, I did a, a market survey because as I was driving the bus in North Dallas, where they had a thing called community education, continuing education. It was like funny, it called like funny. Mm -hmm. So anything you need to know, it was like a little course that you could take for a week or two and teach you the ins and outs. So I took this course on how to market your ideas. Mm. I took this course on how to get publicity. I Did it help? Yes, it helped a whole lot. So when I got, cause Jerry Oaks, the guy who I took the course from, he was the one, the, the promoter behind the mood ring. Mm. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, he did the mood ring. And so he uh, 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 showed me how to, you know, to really set up for marketing. So what we're going to do is going to do the whole shucky ducky thing for kids. Mm -hmm. And so we went and got some kids to come into the, to the room. And we had this little closed end case where we can uh, uh, see like the kids. Commercial. We can see the kids, but the kids can see us. Right. So we wanted to get their idea uh what, how, what they feel about this shucky ducky thing and they really wasn't really feeling it they you know the kids oh yeah mm -hmm. but one of the kids said well if eddie murphy was to do this say this this would be cool i said okay well i knew i couldn't afford no eddie murphy yeah i was about to say so i said oh stand-up comedy mm -hmm. stand-up comedy be good but i didn't know anything about stand-up comedy mm -hmm. and so what i did so because of that little kid, that's where all of that. Because of what the little kid said. Mm -hmm. And what I did was they had an open mic night down at the West End in Dallas. Mm -hmm. I went up, I told a little bus driver joke. When I came off stage, this guy said, hey, man, I like your voice and I like your stage presence. He said, there's an organization called the Comedy Gym that teaches you the ins and outs of stand-up comedy. Mm. I said, really? Yeah. And it was over in Greenville in North Dallas. So I went to the Funny Bone, went there, met the guy named Sam Cox, his, and his partner named Arthur. And he told me, yeah, we can seat you. How much is the course? The course was like $325. I said, well, can you got a, you got a layaway plan? Can I pay a little bit on here and a little bit there? He said, yeah, we can do that. Bam. So I started taking, that was in 87. 87. That was 87. So it was in 87, so I started taking that course. I did that whole course for a year. We did, uh, we would go and get the improv on a Monday night when it was closed, bring in all the people that we can, all our friends and family, so we can get three minutes to five minutes of time so we can present our comedy. So we did that for a whole year. Mm -hmm. Enough practice. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. And then so, and uh, we did that a whole year, but we, <laughs> but I, but, but we made, I made my comedy debut. In 88. March. How you sure got I'm it? Mar I'm March, 13, up. March 14, 1988. Mm -hmm. I, 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 bam. I feel like I was kind of like sort of ready. Sort of ready. And then so we started doing shows. And then the guy. Who, who was the first person you went on the road with? Went on the road with? Like a prominent name coming up. Oh, shoot. I really didn't go on the road. Uh, Back then, they didn't have um, comedy tours? No, no, no. Comedy was really, in 91, 92, mm -hmm. comedy was really coming into its own. Oh, okay. Yeah. It, was coming, it really was coming into its own mm -hmm. uh, because uh, back in 86, 87, 88, 
uh, it was mostly the white guys. It, you had, mm. you had, even at the improv, comic strip live, they was a lot of high school, I mean, a lot of college uh, guys doing the comedy. Wow. Um, so, but who, okay, I know how to get to it. Um, uh, how did you end up on the Apollo? Through Steve Harvey. How did you meet Steve Harvey? Okay, just, just I'm trying to get to it. See, okay, 88, I did my debut. Mm -hmm. So I was working through the, doing the 88, doing my little thing, doing everything I had to do. And then so the, uh, the guy that was teaching the course back in 91, he took us to L.A. In 91, he took us to L.A. for a uh, showcase at the Improv in Santa Monica. Okay. I did my little spiel in Santa Monica, came off the stage, a guy who was a casting director for Hard Copy said, I like you, I like your comedy and everything, but I can't do anything for you in Texas. Mm. You got to come to California. So when I got back to Dallas, you packed up in 91, at the bus company, I gave my re resignation, say I'm gonna get it to go to, to California. California. Everybody, was, man, you be back. <laughs> you you be back. They love saying I, that. I sure was trying to get back to it. It was it was it was struck. How long did you stay in LA for? <clears throat> I stayed that time in ninety one. I, I went in there by June or July of ninety one, and I started coming back home by November of ninety one. Oh, not very long. Not very long because it was it was, it was a hard grind. It's a more, hard grind to it. So uh, I but I had a son back in, in Dallas mm -hmm. and trying to do my career and still thinking about him. Mm -hmm. So I told everybody I was coming back to visit for Thanksgiving, but really I, all my stuff was packed up in the car, but I really was concerned about my son. And so I came, uh, came back and then when I came back, they say, man, uh, they got a comedy thing place at the Rembrandt called Vuku Ray and Steve Harvey is, you know, is over that. I said, okay. We'll go run and meet Steve Harvey. And he was a big name at that time. No, he no, wasn't a big name. He, no he wasn't a big name. No, okay. No, he I'm wasn't just trying to come up. He wasn't a big name at that time. Okay. And so uh, I, I, I went to Vuku Ray in that November, showed Steve my resume. Uh, he looked at it, you know, and then so I went in the bathroom. So I went in the bathroom and got in the stall. They came behind me. <laughs> Him and his partner came behind me and they was talking, discussing me, saying, oh, you know, he, he got this brother me here and he uh he uh, uh been around them white folks. I don't think he's gonna be able to handle this club, you know. They right. don't even know that you're in the stall. Right, they didn't know I'm in the stall. Yeah. They ain't gonna be able to handle these uh, uh you know, this black this is a black crowd, you don't even handle this crowd. And said, okay. And so when they left and I got out, then it was time for me to he called me up on the stage. When he called on the stage and that shucky ducky hit, <laughs> bam. Cause everybody, you know, cause a lot of comedians thought it was corny. A lot of comedians thought it was, you know, uh, that I was just trying to get myself a fancy name to uh, uh, to be above everybody. Mm. But what I was doing was promoting the phrase. Mm -hmm. I was trying to make a phrase popular. Yeah, because you had the phrase way before, before the comedy. I had the phrase way before right. the comedy. So I was trying to make the phrase, because when I first started out, it was like, Cecil Armstrong, the funniest bus driver in America, better known as Shucky Ducky. Mm. Too long. Mm -hmm. Then I said, okay, uh, funniest bus driver in America, Shucky Ducky. Still, too. I said, what I'm trying to promote? I said, Shucky Ducky. I'm going Shucky Ducky. Mm -hmm. So I went with Shucky Ducky, even though, and I knew it was going to get some flack mm -hmm. because Shucky Ducky is too close to shucking and jiving. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, black people, you know, you were shucking it, you know, so they, they kind of look, you know, I knew that. But I was willing to take that risk to make that phrase popular. Mm -hmm. And it was just coming. It was just, and it took a life of its own. You know, because people didn't have to put it back to me. They put it back to me because they was liking it. Because I was really innocent and enjoy doing it out of joy right. and fun of creating something and then making it popular. Taking something from nothing and making it popular. So when, when, you, did, the, sorry, when, when did the quack quack come it in? It came in when Hoagie wrote the rap record. Mm. He wrote the rap record and he put on there. You mean we got this crazy sand going around, man? You know, oh, shucky ducky, quack quack, doom, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. And so I just started putting it in the in the, in the phrase, bam, shucky ducky, bam, quack quack, just put it in, put it in the phrase. Oh, got it. You know, oh. just having fun, man. Ever just having fun and innocent. But what I find out in the comedy world, and the entertainment world, if you succeeded people, my name succeeded a lot of people. 
Mm-hmm. And like I, I tell people, I was the internet comedian before the internet, internet. <laughs> because I went viral before a lot of comedians. Some comedians was established. That name went 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 past them, mm-hmm. and they had to you know hey, I was asking about Shucky Ducky, but at the same time, even though. I did the 88 debut and it did 91. I still was developing as comedy was concerned. Right. I still didn't have enough material. Mm-hmm. And then so, uh, matter of fact, in 91, in 92, Steve Harvey left Vuku Ray. Okay. And so uh, uh, when he left, I'm going I'm going with Steve Harvey. I'm going where, you know, where the action is and, and things of that nature. But but uh, uh, he left in November. And then so... Uh, uh, they got a call from Comic View. They got a call from Comic View, and they said, "Hey, the Comic View is looking for some Dallas comedians." And they said, like, "Yeah, uh, Steve ain't here no more. Shucky, you know somebody can do it." I said, "Well, I tell you what, I'm gonna help y'all get these comedians, but then after that, I'm going with Steve." Mm-hmm. And then so uh, uh, I put it all together to get the comedians, and we draw straws so who can go first, who can go second, because I wanted to be. Fair. Fair. Mm-hmm. So I did the draw the straws, and then I was the one who got the Dallas comedians on the market. I got those who came, I was the one who put them out there. Wow. So let's go back a little bit. I want to go back to you working with Steve Harvey at uh, Buku Lounge. I want Buku Ray. Buku Ray. I want, I want to hear about that part. You know, like how was it working with Steve in these club? not only Steve, but whoever else, well, there'll be – was it Nanette Lee or anybody that, who came through there? What was it like? What was that chemistry like? Man, it was hot, man. That's what I want to talk Vuku, about. Vuku Ray was hot. Uh, we had uh, Dallas Cowboys coming in there. We had uh, celebrities coming in there. Uh, people came to that area because it was really hot. And Steve, I mean, St- Steve was the, the the force behind it because what, what Steve did, what happened when they started the comedy view, I mean, the Vuku Ray, when they started it, they did, I think, Joe Torrey. They did Chris Thomas. And they wasn't getting successful crowds in there. And so they was going to shut it down. And Steve Harvey was the next person up. So Steve Harvey came in, and they didn't tell him that they was going to shut it down. And Steve said, no, 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 man, don't, don't shut it down. Don't, no, no, no. He said, get me on the radio. He said, get me on the radio. And they hooked up with uh, Willis Johnson, KKDA. And Steve Harvey went on that radio, bam! That's that, that place started filling up. Wow, filling up, and then Steve started bringing in some the top comedians: D.L. Hughley, uh, A.J. Jamal, uh, Bernie Mac. He started bringing them. He, he started bringing bringing them in, bringing them in. That place was rocking, rocking. It rocked from '92. I know from '92. Till he left in, in, in November of name. What about uh, Bernie Mac? You you brought his name. I'm a big Bernie Mac fan mm-hmm. as well. R.I.P. to Bernie Mac. Like, how was it? Did you get to meet and talk with Bernie Mac? Yeah, I talked with Bernie Mac. Okay, what was that conversation like? Not much. I mean, you know, very, he had very little words to say, but, you know, he was still developing his... his, his yeah, his, at that his, time, his, at that time itself. Stage. You know, uh, uh you know, but I didn't talk. I mean, I wasn't like a buddy, buddy. Yeah, yeah, buddy, just buddy, in passing like, or, or you know, standing passing. around conversation. But yeah, yeah, but you know, he, he was still like everybody. You know, like everybody else. What did you think when you seen how his career? Because I want to talk about him for a second. How his career blemished? You know, after I mean, you know, how it blew up after that. After what? After you know, after all the years, and you start seeing him on TV, you start because he passed away. Now I just want to know how how you thought what you thought about it. Well, you know the. To make it big, you got to have a you, you got to have an organization around you. Yeah, of course. You got to have a, a manager's talent. You know, there's a lot of deals that's made that you know to get you where you need to get to, and, and a lot of relationships that you have with other people. Uh, but Bernie Manic just had he had that flair, you know, where he just you know kept kept on grinding, kept on grinding, kept on grinding, you know. But you know, he uh, Bernie Mac was on Def Jam twice. Okay. He was at the first time. It was just. Just regular. Then the second time, when the person got booed, and he had to go out there, and he did, I ain't scared of you, mother. When he did that, that phrase right there, parallel, put him up there. That's what that put him, phrase. That, that phrase, that attitude. See, because it's, it's not really the material, it's your confidence, your your swagger, your style. Yeah. All of that plays, uh, uh, plays a part into it. And he did, when he did that, 
that that, that paralleled him right there. Wow! And so, and that, and that took him to where he needed to be to that get took him, notice. Yeah, yeah, it took him to uh, where he wanted to be. And then when the Kings of Comedy pulled, uh, they put all that Remember together. That? Uh, when they put that together, then you know, Bernie Mac was the was the strongest. Well, well, said say he really closed, but when they they edited, they made it Bernie Mac uh, look like the closer because they was he had the high uh, pitch on it. But but you know. But Bernie Mac was was a was a force. Yeah, Bernie he, Mac was he, a force. he was a force. Uh, Steve being at that club and then leaving and you know he blew up. You went with him finally like you wanted to. I went. See the thing with Steve. Steve was very helpful to me. Um, I I, I got to give him his yeah, props. He, he was very good helpful. Conversations he, and stuff. He, he, he was very. I didn't. I didn't talk. He didn't that. talk to him either. I talked. I mean, I I'm a loner, man. So you didn't really talk with him. Well, I'm gonna I'm tell you the reason why I don't really. Uh, Get, I don't say get along with other comedians or get along with people. All my life has always been a, I've been a sidekick to people. All my life has been like with my brother. Okay, if thing you know, we did the partying thing, you know, so I was riding off of his thing when I was in the college. I was a guy who's a musician who did. The, I was riding off his thing when I was in elementary school. This guy named Keith who was a fast track star. I was hanging, with him. but when I started saying something. I got their character that I didn't like, it didn't fit my mind, then I'm shunned. Mm -hmm. You get what I'm saying? So I'm I'm shunned. So my thing was, I got to be my own self man and stand alone, whether it take me 100 years or two years or whatever it is, I've got to be my own self man. But to be in the, how long was you over there at the at the uh, Vuku with uh, Steve? Uh, we, we, was, we, the, about the, from, November to November of for a uh, year. Uh, yeah, for about a year. And you guys would see each other passing, and y'all yeah. would have to work together and conversate. So, yeah. and you say he helped but, you a lot, but how was it? Yeah, because Steve is a, was a very shy person too. He, he, okay. See, he didn't he didn't associate with a lot of people. See, Steve know how to Steve know how to maneuver behind the scenes. Steve know what what he, Steve is a business type of thing thinking person. He know how to strategize. He know what to do. So as he was dealing with you, uh, how did how did he how did he help you in your career? He got me on Apollo. When he when he got got a, a selected for Apollo, he said, "I'm gonna get you on Apollo." He, said, he come to you and told you that. Yeah, he said, "You're gonna get me on Apollo." He said, "He's gonna get me." On how Apollo. did he, how did the conversation go? He just walked in the room because and told I you? was because I was working with him a lot. I mean, I, I I like I said, I don't get in nobody's way. Yeah, and I'm I'm not really. Uh, he liked your personality. He liked me. Yeah. You know, he, he, he liked me. Do you still talk to him today? <laughs> no, I do not talk to him today. Had, when not? the last time you spoke to Steve Hall? Been, it's been a long time. What, 10 years? Long time. <laughs> 15 years. Long time, man. I ain't talked to him. <laughs> 20 years. I ain't talked to him. I ain't, I ain't, talk, I ain't talk to him. Why do you, I guess because people evolve people and grow move apart. on. Yeah, I mean, he's on a different level than I am for as, you know, me, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to say, at Buku Ray, me and Steve is sitting in a limousine. The lines wrapped around the building. Steve Harvey, we in the limousine. Steve said, he said, look at that shot. Look at that line. He said, I'm going to be big, man. I'm going to be big as Eddie Murphy. I said, yeah, right. So you didn't believe it? No, I mean, I, mean, I just said, yeah, right. You know, he's big, just big as Eddie Murphy. He had to do more work mm -hmm. than Eddie Murphy, but he's just as big. You had to see him. Could you see him? Because you saw him coming from where he came from to where he is today. But you say he did, he did more work than Eddie Murphy. But you don't know how much work Eddie Murphy did, do you? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm, what I'm saying, what I'm saying is, Eddie Murphy did movies and did certain that live where he blew up. Mm -hmm. See, Eddie Murphy create put the sex appeal into comedy. Whereas Steve Harvey had to do a lot. He did radio, he did television, he did, that's what I'm saying when he did. Okay. He had to do so much <clears throat> to get there mm -hmm. for his. But see, what really, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> what really put Steve Harvey over was that book. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that what made him bigger than, than life was that book. Yeah, mm -hmm. what, but when you when, when you say you you guys were sitting in limos together, mm -hmm. I know he talked about sleeping in car, cars and didn't have much when he first was you know in Dallas and all mm -hmm. that, and you know just the way he got to Apollo. When he takes you and you guys go to Apollo, when he say I'm gonna get you on there, he already doing the uh, uh, the uh, hosting Apollo at that time. Yeah, he hosting Apollo that. And time. he just say I'm gonna get you on there. Well, he said that <clears throat> at the club. 
that he's gonna get me on the Apollo. He said, I just got on. But I wasn't the only somebody, you know, he had a whole bunch of people. Correct. You know. Then we went over my over my material and he told me you need to do this, do this, do this, you know, Apollo's like this, New York is like this. So he did, you know, he, you know, he did he talk that. With you. you know, he, he 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 talked with me and so when I did it and I hit it, I mean, I knocked it out of the park. And uh uh but then again, he was kind of type of, he was the type of person though that if you if you do something for you, you know, you better you, you got to praise him. You gonna have to praise him. But so you, know, you got to kiss up to. You got to praise him. You know, and well, in, in what way though? Uh, you know, just you know who who got you on the Apollo? Who oh, he say that in front yeah, of yeah, people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so he, he just say about. I don't say about it in front of people. But then you say to him, who got you on Apollo? You know, like that. You know, I, yeah, you did. I, I appreciate that. You know, but you know, I had to do something too. You know, right. I, you know, I, you know, it just you know. But Get he me put, on that was part of it. But that's good. But to me, that's good in some sort of because you have a lot of people who help people and. People act like they're the only ones who did it. Nobody actually gave them right. a leg up. So I admire that because sometimes, honestly, some people have to, you have to drill it in people's head because Steve people don't think about it. Steve helped a lot it. of people. He gave advice to a lot of people. Some people took it, didn't like it, and some people liked right. it. Right. So you have to take it. For, and, but, I, but you have to take criticism and uh, uh, well, you, in, instruction or advice. It's, it's up to you to decide whether you want to use it or not. Yeah. Now there's a lot of stuff I should have used which, that, that he gave me. You know, told me to give me a lawyer, give me uh, this. You know, and you didn't. Well, I did. I, I, you know, I, I did. You know, but I didn't get the right one. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, so uh, so it's a lot of stuff he did. I mean, Steve, it, 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 he, I, he didn't do anything to me. Right. Now he might did. Now people come to me that they said they don't. He did something to them, but he never done any really thing to me. Yeah, yeah, I've heard so many different stories on Steve, yeah. good and bad. Right. Because he's such a big name, he's gonna you. You're you, gonna get. You're that. gonna get that. Yeah, yeah. You're gonna get a whole lot of people. I mean, they lie on me. Yeah. You know. Uh, so, but what's I the biggest lie you've ever heard about you? <laughs> then I got booed. Uh, then I got booed uh, on Def Jam. And, 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 and it didn't happen. And then, uh, uh, and then Chris Rock uh, destroyed my career. How did Chris? Where Rock? did that come from? That yeah, uh, Mike Epps said that. Mike Epps said that on uh, on the Breakfast Club. Why would he say something like that? Because, okay, when I when I did Def Jam, so I had to go. I said, it had to go so much, so back, so much stuff happening. See, when I tried to get on Def Jam in ninety one, okay. I gave Steve Harvey the tape. Steve Harvey showed it to the Jeff Jam people. Mm -hmm. And the Jeff Jam people said, no, nah, I don't think he can, you know, do the same thing that Steve said. He can't do no, you know, no black cut. They said, mm -hmm. Steve said they didn't, they didn't, they don't think he can do it. I said, okay. Then so Bill Bellamy came down to Boo Boo Ray, do the show. So I was working with Bill Bellamy. And Bill Bellamy lived in New Jersey and the Peppermint Room made the decisions on who can be on Def Jam. So Bill Bellamy told me, hey man, why don't you come up to, uh, uh, New Jersey. So when the tickets got real cheap, I got me a ticket and went up there. Did real good. Came down. The guy, uh, uh, Bob Sumner said, you're going to be on Def Jam. And I said, okay. So I get back to Dallas. We're on the Tom Jonah show. I just whispered to Dom, Tom Jonah about it. He said, can we talk about it? I said, no, we can't talk about it. We can't talk about it. And then uh, he kept on nugging me and I said, yeah, let's talk about it. <laughs> Y'all gonna be on the time, uh, be on Def Jam. They said, Shuck gonna be on Def Jam, bam. And then when Def Jam came to do the Aaron, they didn't call me. Wow. Mm. Then, but I called them. And then they sent me a letter say, you call, we call you, don't you call us. Ooh, wow. <laughs> you know, and then so, and, and, and I, uh, then I just said, man, they don't want to, they want that old nasty comedy. They don't want that, you know, clean mm -hmm. comedy. Because I had to sit back and realize I didn't really fit Def Jam mold. Mm. I wasn't really talking about going, you know, pussy. You know, I, yeah, I, I, I would. I, I but you end up on I, there, right? I, yeah, well, because what happened? Bill Cosby said something about Def Jam, and then they changed hosts. Martin left, and so they got Joe Torre to be the host. Okay. So they now they need a new crop of comedians. Mm. And since I was working with Tina Graham, who was a was an assistant to Bob Sumner. So she we, she was pushing for me to get on there. And then I finally got on. But they wasn't expecting me to hit like I hit. I mean, I didn't knock them out the park. But you I didn't have them fallen, but I was I was I was steady in my jokes and I was steady in in the performance. So who's hosting when you was Joe Torre? Joe Torre was the host. When when Joe Torre was hosting and everything, was was Steve still involved at this time or no? 
Uh, I think we, I think we was, I think we was going out. I think we because the club had broke up. Uh, I think it was going on uh, uh, several ways. Uh, several that ways, time. everything. That, that, so did you get on the Def Jam? Def Jam, and so now they're coming back with the All Star Def Jam. This is where you get a celebrity host and the person that did good on Def Jam headlining. Okay, okay. I was picked. I was picked. I did Def Jam one time. Now I'm a celebrity. I'm I'm, I'm an All Star Def Jam participant. Okay, the person that's gonna host mine is Chris Rock. Okay. All right. And then so uh, Chris Rock was going to host mines. And then they said um, they wanted to change. My manager called me and said he wanted to change. They want to change from Chris Rock to Mark Curry. They want Mark. They want, they want Mark, you to be with Mark Curry. You, you want to change from Mark Curry to Chris Rock? I said, no, I won't say, I'm going to stay with Chris Rock. Cause Chris Rock no Eddie Murphy because the reason why I did the doing the stand-up comedy because what the little boy said, if Eddie Murphy was to do this, yeah, maybe I can feel right. that friendship. But and it, and so I said, okay, we'll do it that way. Also, I still wasn't developed. I really, I don't had about so many minutes worth of material. Yeah, and then I had some sure power, power. But I'm a marketer, so if I know if I give up all of this, this, this other good material, I'm gonna have to start writing, and I know I'm not a great writer. So I was dancing around those jokes. Just dancing around, putting patching here and patching that and, and patching that. Even though it worked a little, because you know you can go and edit and make stuff look good. It, it, it you know get good. So I was dancing. The comedians know what I was doing. You know maybe the audience didn't know what I was doing. And then so when Chris Rock uh, came, he's talking about Shucky Ducky needs some jokey wokies. <laughs> oh, he said that. He said that. He said. Whoa! Shuck it, wait Ducky. a minute. This is good stuff now. Said, <laughs> Boss Talk can get in there now. He said, wait a minute. I didn't hear that. See, yeah, now, he said, he said Chucky Ducky needs some, need some what? Jokey Wokey. Man, come yeah. on, bro. So he done outed you, and he said that on the stage. Yeah, he said it on the stage, but it didn't air because reading why do you know why it didn't air? Why? Because I told him not to air it. You told him don't air it. I told him. And they listened to you. They didn't have to listen to me. They listened to you though. Yeah, you know. So when Chris Rock said that, did you ever talk to him or say anything to him? No, you know? we we hugged. He said, um, you know, uh, he, he, he we hugged. A little bit when he's uh, and he said we're gonna get you, I'm gonna get you something or do something like that. But you know my ego and your and your you know you have your ego like I mean, you ain't gonna just throw me no bone you know, exactly. You know my you know my ego. He wanted to try to make it up to you because he said that. I don't know if he wanted to make it. Up. I didn't get the chance to get the friendship to uh, to do that. Like but, I said, I'm a loner. I, I but, didn't, but in his and he really he said he that. Might, yeah, he might for a reason. Right. But then when I think that. about comedians, comedians be on stage saying all sorts of stuff about. Everybody else, right. and you know, so it's but just you got, you got to understand talk. this though. I wasn't a genuine comedian, correct? I was a person who's trying to create a phrase and make the phrase right. pop popular. So, so I don't really know all know the that. culture. And my thing was, I wasn't good at talking about people in the audience or talking about nobody because I had all kinds of faults. You can just wipe my ass out. <laughs> You I know. gotta ask you this now. You you shouldn't have said all that because well, now you gotta answer, you gotta answer this. Why well, I gotta say because you done gave me too much information. <laughs> uh, when 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 Chris Rock gets slapped on stage, at this point, this been years this later years now. After. But you see this because the world reacted to it. What did you think? Well, I didn't even see it. Uh, bro you, man, bro man called me. Oh, uh, <laughs> bro man called you. Bro man called me. Hamburger called me. Uh, uh, Joker, did you see it? I see what? <laughs> I ain't see nothing. Cause they knew the story about Joker Wokey too. They knew the story. Yeah. They see knew, what I'm they saying? Knew, they, this they, makes they, sense they, to me. They, they they knew the story, and I said uh, I said no, and then they said, bam, he, he he slapped Kurt Rock. So I had to go back and go go find, go it. find it, and then I started saying, I said, oh okay, you know, I don't condone the slap. <laughs> But I understand. <laughs> no, no, no. You know, I get it because I understand, you know, because, you know, the Bible says you reap what you sow. You know, I know you studied Buddhism. I studied the Bible. Yeah. But if you do something, it'll come back on you. That's why you got to be careful what you do because everybody's watching y'all's careers. But in that case, yeah. everybody's done something at one Everybody, point or the but, other. But at the end of the day, I'm just saying, some people's come in some way. Some people come in another way. I'm just saying, yeah. that was a, uh, that was a. Uh, uh, if I'm looking as a person to spectate, I'm gonna say, "Dang, you know, he had his run on saying certain things about certain people where people didn't like it before." 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, he, he done done. He done, he, he, he done said a lot of stuff, like, man. And he, he used to he used to he used to down the Def Jam comedians. See what I'm saying? Mm. He used to put because you know what he said. Because uh, uh, I told him don't air mines. You know what his uh, agent told me when we was in the fire escape talking what about he it. He wanted to know how did Shucky Ducky get so popular and he only did one Def Jam. Yeah, he didn't know the work God had been using you to do when mm. you was when he was working and doing all the passing the flyers out, putting right. his name out there. That was a foundation bill. But you know, some things Chuck and Dougie ain't for everybody to no, even it, know. Right. So he ain't gonna know everything. Right. He didn't know that. He, I mean, he didn't, didn't know that. But see, in this business is a stand up comedy. You want your name to reign supreme. I don't want to have to put funny, hilarious. All I had to want to put is Chuck and Ducky. Ducky. Bernie Mac, Steve Harvey, Kevin Hart. You know they funny. Mm -hmm. But your name rang just it, like that it, right it, to this day. I know it's, and, and, and even when I had slack, and I'm gonna tell you another thing, I had my nervous breakdown on stage too. I had a, I had, on stage. I, I had a nervous breakdown on stage. Uh, after, I, after I did the, uh, the Def Jam, all this stuff was happening, I, uh, I got, Cast in a in a, in a stage play mm -hmm. called A Fool and His Money. David Tower, the guy who did Baggage Claim in the first Sunday, mm -hmm. he the one produced that uh, the stage play. Yeah, and I played Uncle Skeeter in the play, and uh, I did such a good job. I became second billing, you know, the second person to be mm -hmm. in, uh, introduced next next to the last person to be introduced, and uh, so I did that, and then. The, the the comedy just wasn't going like you know just like it what like I wanted to because I still couldn't get developed like I wanted to because I did the stage play, so I did another uh, stage play called A Woman's Fed Up. Mm -hmm. I did Woman's Fed Up, and uh, at the meantime, they called me to do some stand up. I still wasn't right where I needed to be, so the guy said, "Man, we got you on. It paid me some pretty good money," and he said, "Uh." uh you gonna hit line. So I get to, this was in Saginaw, Michigan. I get to Saginaw, Michigan, and um, I'm gonna headline this thing, but I'm kinda nervous. Cause I still, you know, I just feel like I ain't, I'm just not. Still, still not confident. I feel like nah, I'm not the right kind of comedian. I still ain't really got it, really. So I asked the guy, say, man, can I host the show? Oh no, you can't host the show. You headline. You, you, you the headline, you the biggest name on it, on the ticket. You know, I said, <laughs> I said oh, okay. He said, oh, you, then you know how do, how do black people do you? You scared? Are you scared? I said, no, I ain't scared. No, I ain't scared. I was scared. I was scared. <laughs> and then so, uh, uh, so I said, well, let me take a drink. I gave me a drink. And, uh, you know, maybe that gave me a little Nerves. calm me down. So mm -hmm. I took that first drink. Then I went. Uh, Were you state. drinking at that time? Were you like a drinker? I was not really, not a really, 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 really. But he drinker. nervous. He trying to cool. He trying, trying to get I'm trying to cool. I'm trying to get myself together. I'm trying to be. I'm trying to be uh, be balls on be balls on that you damn stage. Show up with that with that S on his chest, baby. And then yeah. so uh, uh, I took that drink, and then I got behind the stage, took another drink, and then his wife gave me a drink. <laughs> Too many drinks. I was the last one. <laughs> time I hit that stage, all three of them drinks hit in at the same time. I must have said the same jokes about I don't know how many times. I must have said I lost my pockets. I cost, I cut the sound man out, the light man out. I was embarrassed. As like I was, I was embarrassed. Killed it. I said, God, dog. I said, I, boy, I was just so embarrassed by that. Then I say, then the circus called me. The circus called and asked me, do I want to you know, do Because they saw me in this play with this girl, so they thought me would be a good combination. So they called. So yeah, I, I, I'll take the meeting to see what was going on. And I took the meeting, and next thing you know, I'm the ringmaster for the Universe Soul Circus. Mm. Wow. I ring, so, so I did that for almost five to eight years, almost wow. 10 years wow. doing that. That's hard. Uh, 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 doing that. I don't know why what comes to my mind when you're saying all this stuff is your father where he said he can make a job out of anything. He can make a job out of anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and that's, and that's, uh, that, that's what happened to me. I'll take a job. I'll make mm -hmm. a job. I ain't, I ain't too got no pride to do. Even the pandemic. I, should, I started, because uh, I know I wasn't a top billing comedian. Mm -hmm. And a lot of, everybody started podcasts and all that. I'm a man physically work. I yeah. like physically work. Yeah. And so, uh, so I started a lawn service business. So I, got, I, I made money doing lawn Long service. Long service. I want to ask you about, I, I want to go back to Steve. I'm not to Steve, to the to the Apollo. 
I got to get back into that Apollo. Is yours anywhere? It's not about Apollo, but, you know, with the com comedy that you've been talking about, you keep saying that you didn't feel like your comedy was up to the par where you wanted it to be. When, in all this time, when did you feel like you reached to that point? Did you ever reach to that point? I reached, well, I started watching Kevin Hart. Wow. Because I said, where am I going to get the material from? Okay, Richard Pryor, Eddie Murphy, Bill Cosby are superstars. Mm -hmm. we, we, we feel like we'll never get to that point. But the person that really brought black comedians to a point where they can be, feel good and comfortable and lucrative was Robin Harris. We watched Robin Harris. We all could be the, uh, Robin Harris. We might not even get an Eddie Murphy or Richard Pryor or Bill Cosby, but we can get to that, we can get to that Robin Harris because he was down home and, I, we, and we, lo we loved it. So, we, so get there. But it wasn't until I saw Kevin Hart. Kevin Hart talks about his life. I said, well, shoot, if he talk about his life, man, I got a whole bunch of stories I can talk about. But how could I put him in into that comic feel. feel? And then that's what I've been doing. I, I just, I left Germany. I went to Germany. Uh, yeah, we talked while you was in Germany. Germany. I was in Germany. Shoot. I, I, I let it go. So my thing was, I had to start letting loose. I wasn't letting loose. I wasn't being, I wasn't loose. Yeah. I was too trying to be nice structured. guy, trying to be structured, trying to be this. I said, I gotta let it loose. When wow. I let it loose, them jokes is coming. Kevin Hart is a different animal when he come down to just being himself and talking about his family too and doing his thing. Right. And, and you see his whole layout and in, in, in the way his comedy came, he had some downfalls before his peak. And that helps too, right? Like, like, yeah, that, you, cause that. nobody didn't expect him to be the Kevin Hart he is today. When I talked to Faze on Love, he was like, he, he, I, you talking about Blackfoot, you know, he was just a dude that was around, you well, know? Uh, Kevin Hart worked hard and he learned from Dane Cook for how his marketing is concerned. Yeah. And uh, he took a chance on himself for as going to uh, clubs. You know, I, I read the story, I got his books. I mean, I, I read all of them. I bought Chris Rock book, Bernie Mac's book, uh, Sid's book, deal. But I buy. I mean, I buy books and I read. I support them. They don't know I'm supporting them. Yeah. But I support they them. They know I, now. I, I, you know, I don't. You know, I, I support them. I don't say. I don't say very much. They all. A lot of comedians put me down and sort of like, but I don't say much, man. No. I ain't got. Nothing, I ain't got nothing to prove to That's nobody. Good. That's good. Because I, I, I did what I had to do. My name still reigns for supreme, whether oh, it's good or bad. Because Chuck and Duggan mean disappointment or excitement. So you go. If you go talk to me on the bad side, you got me. Talk on the good side, you got me. Let me ask you about the Apollo. I was. Going a while ago, uh, just to get back to, did you? What I know, Jamie Foxx used to be around that every now and then. Did you ever run into Jamie when you was there? No, I saw Jamie at the comedy store, but I didn't. You know, that you know, just passing passing by. by. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But but the reason I say that because at that Apollo, it was. Um, I mean, did you go on as a act, or or did you get booed, or was it? No, you, I didn't get booed. You I, did I went on, on as an act. As, okay. a, as a as a as a. Uh, Special comedian. As a special comedian. Yeah. Okay, there you Steve go. Steve Harvey so, got me on there as so a special when you, comedian. So when you came out, how was the energy, and how many times did you even do the Apollo? I did the Apollo one time. Okay. It was good. It was good. I mean, I was just, I was just myself. I just I was just myself, and it did, I did good. I yeah. mean, I did, I just, I, the, the, the tape is on, on my Facebook page, it's on my YouTube channel. But how was it, how was it when you come out there, what, what made New York and that whole situation different than what you'd ever face. A lot of times we're afraid of New York because we think New York is a hard people uh, and things of that nature. Now I was kind of concerned about it being in New York because it's shucky ducky. I said, oh man, they're gonna think I'm country and all that kind of thing. I found them jokers just as country as we are. Yeah. Some of the people come from Mississippi and Alabama. Uh, you know, so the, uh, they up in uh, up in New York. So they really enjoyed you know what I did. I mean, they had, uh, they had good. And matter of fact, when I left the Apollo that night I performed, Tina Graham was there. She said, "Well, they got a club. They got a club over here called across from the Apollo called the Perk Club, the Perkins Club, or something yeah. like that." We Perkins were just Club. in New York yeah. when I called you, yeah. and I, we was over there by there. It was a Perkins Club, and so they had a comedy night that night. And I just came off this high of being at the Apollo, and there was some gangsters in there, hey. and uh, they were saying, uh, "This gangster put up. This, I got a hundred dollars. Somebody can make me laugh because ain't nobody made them laugh all night. Hundred dollars. You put it up." I walked out there with that hundred dollars in my pocket. <laughs> oh man, that's good stuff. So you wasn't playing no games with them because I had the joy of comedy. It wasn't it was just having fun with it. 
I wasn't in competition with people. I just like to have fun and tell my jokes. And I learned the way of phrasing the jokes from the comedy class. Okay. Okay, now, now you're trying to bring black experience into it. See, because I wasn't a comedian that goes deep to, to sexual or to talking about white people and this and all that, I wasn't that type of comedian. So in that era, Def Jam was an era of bam, in your face type of a comedy. It wasn't no intellectual type of a comedy. It wasn't comedy you got to think. If you got to think about the comedy in the black clubs, they ain't don't want to hear that. Did you you were, you was on BET Comic View. I did Comic View. What was what was that like dealing with BET and dealing with you know that whole setup that they had arranged for that programming? That was that was that was that was that was really good. I mean, matter of fact, like I said, I got the comedians uh, from Dallas to get on. Uh, a comic View, but how was it? Did they did they they just filmed it here and broadcasted it, or did well, they, you have to first, go somewhere? How well, was it? Well, they they filmed the well, the, the one that they did. They filmed all the people here when okay. I gave the straws, so they they showed little clips from the Vuku Ray type of thing. Okay, then they started the contest. Okay, DL was getting ready to leave. I think DL was getting ready, suing them. They had a problem with DL, or DL had a problem with them, and so they was getting ready to uh, DL was gonna, uh, go so in order for them to come up with a host, they did the contest, mm. and so Cedric became that uh, became the new host of Comic View, and then so I just got into the contest just for exposure of uh, of Chucky Duck. Chucky Duck, you always on that. Uh, uh, yeah, Duck. I, I was just going. I got. I just wanted to get the exposure. I didn't want to win nothing. I just because I knew what my material was. I, I you couldn't go that name out. I just get the name out. That's all it was. And then I wind up winning. And then that's the, that's what God do. You see, I, I, I wind up winning a thirty minute special. Man, and I didn't have. I say, man, they got thirty minutes of jokes. Nah, I ain't have no thirty minutes. Of jokes. See what I'm I said I ain't have no thirty minutes jokes. And then I said, I said back, I told him, I got a problem. He said, What? I won. He said, What's your problem? I ain't got no jokes. Wow. And then so, but I had, I wrote this thing back in '81, uh, titled "Ashamed of Being Black." I wrote that little piece. I put it on that special. Man, that's mm -hmm. hard, man. So after that, what was the next one? You did uh, the Indian Def Jam. Mm -hmm. And Def Jam was one where. Uh, you know that was some. All these things was so popping back during that time. All of them was that popping. was the hottest things out during that time. But see, between that ninety two and ninety four, I was hitting everything. I was on everything. I was on the Apollo. I was on BET's Comic View. I was on Def Jam. I was on Uptown Comedy. Club, yeah, Uptown, uh, Uptown Comedy Club. I was on everything. So I was popping. Bam, you every, did your thing everywhere. You know, so uh, but I, I was I was trying to find people to help me get that. Let me ask you this, cause and and I'm gonna, you know the thing I want to understand is right now we got a different time, and a lot of time people get caught in a maze. Uh, I talk to all the comedians, mm -hmm. I talk to uh, Faison, I talk to Carlos Miller, I talk to all of them. I've talked to Country Wayne, I've talked to a bunch of these guys, um, Alex Thomas, uh, Ron G, right, and and the list goes on two different type of comics and I always ask this question to everybody when the internet phase came you had these comics that they learned the internet matter of fact Kevin Hart's one of them actually uh, that he figures that out too because he just dope but a lot of times people struggle with these two worlds one is the internet world where these comics you got the internet skits the comics they jump up two three one minute they do their thing. Then you got the traditional ones like yourself who stand on that stage, uh, had had that pressure put on them. You know, both two different companies making money. Both of them make them worlds making money today. How are you learning to maneuver in them? Do you think the, the internet one is one to respect? Or do you think it's one where they got to grow some more? Or do you feel like the one that basically the traditional way is the way? Both of them are the way. Both of them in the way. I, I applaud the internet comedians. See, when we were coming up, we had to work on our act, then get exposure. Now you can get exposure, now you gotta work on your act. It just reverse. It just That's reversed. all it is. You know, yeah, there's no really no school for comedians, even though I went to a comedy gym type of a thing. If you wanna get out there, the only way you're gonna get good at comedy, you gotta get on that stage each and every day. And the more you get on that stage, the more you express your feelings, the more you get your voice to who you are. Not what somebody else wants you to be, is what you are. Now, everybody ain't gonna like you. 
Everybody ain't gonna get your comedy. Comedy is what you can re- relate to. If I can relate to it, it's funny. If I can't relate to it, it's not funny to me. That don't mean you're not funny. It's just I can't relate to what you're saying. Wow. So you know, you just have to be who you are. Ain't nobody, ain't nobody uh, better than nobody. It's just somebody who got the most exposure, the person who got the big exposure. Everybody talking about the goat between Michael Jordan and, and LeBron, LeBron James, James and all that kind of stuff. What you gonna base it upon? If you base it upon skill. LeBron James got the skills. He can play any position. He's got the skills. And he make every city that he's in good. For as but but you bank but you bank it on marketing. LeBron James only can affect the cities that he's in. Michael Jordan affected the world. Michael Jordan, who's more exciting to watch in their heyday? Michael Jordan. All day long. Michael Jordan was a little Michael Jordan so called Michael Jordan was stingy. Yeah. He was selfish. Yeah. He was stingy. But LeBron trying to please everybody. Okay. He said when you try to please everybody or try to be good to everybody and try to be not, it's, it's boring. Did you ever want to get into any like the acting and all that? Like, I did acting. I did a I did a movie with Alex Baldwin. Okay. Michael Jordan. I know you said you Michael Jordan White. I did the one plays. Plays. You did, you did. I, Michael Jordan White movie. Uh, Thick as thieves. Thick, oh yeah, and brother yeah, man, yeah. brother man put me on that. They was they was. They, That's your boy right there. Yeah, I mean brother man, hamburger. Those guys I go to all the time. That's hard, man. Like brother man, I seen him on. Uh, I think it was that Martin. Uh, original uh, re- ballad. The reunion. Called, original ballad. Yeah, the reunion. Uh, uh, Martin's. Martin, yeah. I seen him on there. Mm-hmm. I was happy to see him again on that ca- on that set, man. Uh, how did you and him even meet? Well, he came to Steve Harvey's uh, comedy club that it was in Dallas, and uh, we met, met. And also, we went overseas. Went overseas. Mr. Johnson, who was booking stuff over at SOS clubs, uh, put, put all together. Wow! So, brother overseas. man, brother man was in that in 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 the stand up comedy before going on Martin, or just after? No, Martin? after Martin. After Martin. After Martin. We we felt uh, I think Rishon kind of uh, Rishon who owned a hip hop comedy stop in Houston kind of figured it out. And he booked uh, uh, Brother Man at the uh, at his club in Houston. And we said, well, we need to bring him on up here to Dallas. And so we brought him, you know, brought him to Dallas at Steve Harvey Club. You know, so, uh, you know, it was, it was something that is a character that caught on. See, sometimes you got to figure out what's, what to catch on. You, you never know what the public gonna like. But if you got a certain type of niche or a certain type of uh, something they like, it catches. Uh. And then you can capitalize on it. And Brother Man, been, he, brother Reginald Ballard been capitalizing Reginald on it all, all this time. You know he used to be a linebacker for yeah, SMU. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know. he was a bad boy. Yeah. You know, that's what people don't understand, man. When you, whatever your mission is, you're gonna get to it. There's no way around it. That's your destiny, right? So, I, I mean, what? who would you like to, you know, what would you like to do now in this stage in your career? What's the what's the thing that you would like to accomplish? Well, I've com- I sit back and thought about my life. I could co- have accomplished a lot. I mean, my my goal was to make Shucky Duck a household word. I reached that. You did. Now, I didn't say I was going to be the best comedian, uh, you know, but I, I can be the best comedian to myself because I'm learning the game. You got to learn the game. And once I learned that game, and I said, I saw him say, "What Kevin Hart doing?" I said, "Oh man, I'm ready now." Yeah, I, I'm, I, I ain't standing on that stage with the best of them. And then I said, "Man, you're an entertainer, man. You can't have no gray hair. You know, people want you." To, I said, "Man, look at him. <laughs> I, I ain't trying to be 19. I ain't trying to be. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to be who I am." Man, that's the best way to be. I'm gonna be who I am. They like the gray hair. They don't like. It. I see them young girls still come out to me with the gray hair. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, if you and, and if you had to sum it all up, your legacy and your dynasty of who you are, the legend that you are. Um, what would you want people to remember you by? To remember me by? Yeah, like if they thinking of Chucky Day, if there was a documentary being wrote, up, or, or what would you? What key thing element? In, in, in your character, is it the Shucky Ducky name, the brand? Well, it had to be the Shucky Ducky name. Is to say taking something from nothing and making it valuable. Yeah. And uh, if you can, if you ain't got a job, create you one. Wow. Yeah. If you ain't got a job, don't you have to sit back and wait for nobody to give you nothing. So then, and don't I don't sit back and wait. I yeah. mean, yeah, I, like I said, when I, when I did this comedy thing, man, and I know I gave myself five years to get in there and get out, and I was making some money, more money than I ever made. Wow, what would you say? What would you say to a young guy that's looking, that's trying to learn how to do 
what you've done, like the stand up, like the, to be, be able to get himself on TV. Because you're talking, you've been on major networks, man. You've done things that some guys will never do that would love to be able to do that. How would you tell them, what would you tell them to keep them motivated? Well, what can I say? I, just do it. I mean, at the, don't give up. No, you ain't got to give up. Sometimes you might have to stop and, and take a breathe and look and, and evaluate and then may go back for it. You know, a lot of people say, don't stop. Don't, don't do Man, but see, if you're doing comedy, you got to get material. Yeah. The only way you're going to get the material is you got to do more things than just one thing. You got to do more stuff in, in, than the newspaper. You got to actually do some certain things. I tried to flip houses. House flipped on me. <laughs> <laughs> Did you, after you bombed, oh, I say bombed. I don't want to say bombed. You say bombed? Yeah, after you tripped out and, and you got drunk. Mm -hmm. And what, what did you think the next day? That I need to do something else. <laughs> <laughs> that I need to do something else. I, like I said, I did. And that's, that's when the circus call. Yeah. Right. And then when the circus call, okay, I said, I'm going to do the circus. And I became the remaster. Looked at the schedule. Saginaw was nowhere on the schedule. Mm. They rearranged the schedule. Wow. Next to thing, Saginaw was on the schedule. Hey. And then here you go. I go, time I get in the hotel, they say, ooh, that the dude that cussed us out. <laughs> <laughs> so what I find out is, don't don't run from nothing. Don't try to hide from nothing. Face it. Face it. Whether the criticism is good or bad, face it. Because you're going to receive it again. You're going to see it again. So you're going to be true to yours. So any criticism that come to me, I'm facing it. Man. I got a question. Go so in all these years of um, promoting Shucky Ducky, mm -hmm. I know how society is. How, how many people have tried to steal that name? Oh, a lot of people have done, not tried to steal it. They've done it. Done it. Yeah, done it. I mean, you, you used had to take it. them to court. The user, nah, I didn't take them to court. I was, you know, who first one who did? Uh, uh, who stole Quincy it? Jones used it. What? Really? In the juke joint. Shucky Ducky, quack quack. How did doom, you feel? Doom. I was, I was kind of like flatter, but Steve Harvey had a manager at the time named uh, Warren. Mm -hmm. Warren came to me and told me, you know, about it. Oh man, we gonna we gonna we gonna get at we gonna get at Quincy Jones, it's right? Like, you know, but he turned around and died. He died in the in the limousine, mm. in the limousine. And then so I tried to do it myself. And then the, uh, the attorney, uh, the, the attorney general, I'm not attorney, the entertainment attorney said, mm -hmm. if I did it, it would mess me up in the business. He said you probably get thirty thousand or something, something like that. He said, yeah, because that name right there, that, it'll, 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 yeah, yeah. It'll, it'll mess you up in the business. And then I said, oh, okay. So I just went on, and, and a lot of people. Herman Cain used it. Uh, uh, Booker T used it in the wrestling. There's a lot of people used it, mm. uh, you know. But you know, I was the first one. I mean, yeah. I've, I've got the documentation to prove that I was the first one. Right. You know, I was doing Pierre show. He talking about, well, you stole it, and I said, well, you steal too. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Pierre, man. Yeah. He's doing a hell of a job. Yeah, he's doing there. a good job. Man, I, I love his show, man. It's so clean. And, but yeah. you know, uh, I just I, I always think about you guys, man. When I when I see everybody grinding, I like, man, I, you here in Dallas, and to be here and and not get you be crazy as hell. So when I thought about it, when after we had talked. Yeah, like, man, I gotta get Chuck it. Chuck it, Dougie, gotta come on my show, man. So thank you so much for coming, man. Top three comedians of all time, dead or alive. Top, wait, wait, wait. top three comedians of all time, dead or alive. Who is your top three? Uh, top three, three, only three. Number one. Or we want to go number three first. Whichever, uh, one. whichever order you want to put it in. Do I have, do it have to be influencers or just by the body the work or what top, I think? No, about it's it. your top Overall, three. Your top no category. Three. No category. No category. Number one. I, I well, you know, Richard Pryor gonna have to be. Man, I love Richard Pryor. That's everybody's yeah, number yeah. one. Yeah. That's a good because, choice because Richard Pryor, when he brought out that uh, that nigga's crazy. See, a lot of when we were growing up, people didn't want to be no comedian. We wanted to be the folk tops. We wanted to be the Temptations. We wanted to be James Brown. We wanted to be singers, you know. But when he brought out that uh, that nigga's crazy, when that album came out, everybody was reciting that stuff in school because I had the album. I had, it, you know, I wasn't trying to be a comedian at the time. I just liked that material, and so uh, he influenced a lot of young people who wanted to be comedian. That's mm -hmm. how Eddie Murphy mm -hmm. wanted to become That's a comedian. Correct. That's so true. You, you know, so he had he had that. Number uh, two. Number two. Number two. Oh, shoot. Who got to say is number two? Uh, I got to say Robin Harris. Robin mm -hmm. Harris. Robin, then, that's Robin, a good. Uh, Robin, Robin Harris. And number Robin three? Number three. 
I got to say, Eddie Murphy. Eddie Murphy, man. Because Eddie Murphy put the sex appeal in comedy. Right. You could be you could be on stage and you got a raggedy t-shirt or whatever. But then you start dressing them leather pants and stuff like that and people want to be a rock star, that'd be Eddie Murphy. Eddie got, Murphy. Earlier you mentioned that Kevin Hart was the reason why you started, you know, when you thought of, he changed the game. Was he the first person who started um, doing comedy about his life and so forth? Oh, no. Like mm -hmm. Richard Pryor talked about his life. Okay. Uh, Eddie Murphy talked about his life. It's just the way he done it's it. It's the, the way, way he, you, you looking, so you, here's, here's Kevin Hart starting out. I, I, I just hear stuff on the road. Kevin Hart didn't care who went in front of him or who went, who he had to come behind. He didn't care. Mm. He stayed on focus of what he wanted to present. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. A lot of us as comedians, we'll be afraid that somebody's gonna kill, kill your show. They come up, they bam, they bam, 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 knock it out. Then I got to come and uh, do a thing and my stuff just die. Mm. Cause a lot, of, my, a lot of my stuff did that. Yeah, it did that. I mean, I did I did a show uh, in the uh, in the in, the, in the, the Bermuda. I did a show in Bermuda, and all them guys were bam, 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 bam. Sex going down, doing bam, and I come up there with this shucky ducky, and and then shit was just going going way down. Yeah, and I told the man, I said, man, we gotta change the order of this show. He said, no, nah, I ain't change. He said, we can't change the order of the show. I said, man, we gotta change the order of the show. He said, we're gonna change the money. I said, hey, we ain't changing no money. I said, people still coming in because I'm here. We ain't changing no money. He said, well, what are we gonna do? I said, I'll tell you what, I'll die every night, but we ain't changing no damn money. Yeah. I said, he changed the order of that show. I hosted. it. Show went well. Because I knew what my lane was. Exactly. I, I, knew, I, knew what my, real. I, I knew what my strength was as far as my comedy was concerned. Because I was still trying to develop. See, because you got people gunslingers want to show you up off of your crowd, off, off of people who come to see you. Yeah. And then the people looking at me talking about, man, you should have shook shook it up. You shouldn't even been here. You should have been somewhere else, you know. So if I was supposed to say, okay, I'm going to name some comedians, and I want you to tell me the first thing that comes on your mind about these comedians, like what stands out the most. Um, Cat Williams. Very intelligent, uh, very funny, natural comedian. Bernie Mac. Uh, Bernie Mac, very confident. Uh, I, I just say he he had a lot of confidence. He had a lot of style. He had a style. Dave Chappelle, very intelligent, intellectual, more of a storyteller to me than a comedian. Mm. Bill Cosby, Bill Cosby, storyteller, uh, a revolutionary. Uh, very, he had a lot of power in what he did, but no, he was very re revolutionary. Eddie Griffin. Very intelligent, natural comedian. He can do, uh, I mean, he, he's got substance. He can talk about anything, make anything funny. Gary Owens. Gary Owens, uh, I don't know about <laughs> Gary Owens. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I was going to get you that I, one. I, you don't know about Gary Owens. <laughs> I mean, he, he he made it. I mean, he, he, he used what he got. And he made it. So I can say he used what he got. And he made it. <laughs> Michael Blackston. Michael Blackston. I don't know that much about Black Blackston. He, you know, uh, was, you know, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> but he's you know, funny. but he he made it too. Okay, got it. Country Wayne. Country Wayne. Very, I, I I like Country Wayne. Uh, somebody told me one day, man, these internet comedians they ain't funny and such and such and such. Like, Country Wayne, he ain't that dude funny. I said, let me go see Country Wayne. And so, went and so I went to see Country Wayne, and I say somebody's having him because I say he say he, he, he sound good to me and he look good to me because see Country Wayne has that presence. He has a star presence. He has a presence about him. He's mm -hmm. likable. He's mm -hmm. enjoyable. And then he's using what he uh, what he got and what he know, even though it's simple, but he's using it and his personality is so likable, mm -hmm. and that's the reason why he's winning. Um, phase on love. That's, and he crazy. <laughs> <laughs> he crazy. That, I mean, he, he, he's crazy. He, he say what is on his mind. He say what he's, you know, it's his opinion. Mm -hmm. Everybody's coming from their opinion. That's true. Right. Wow. So you, you got a show coming up this week at the Improv. Yes, March the 29th, a Wednesday night. Yeah. Oh, did you ever meet Dick Gregory? Yeah, I met Dick Gregory. Tell me a story about him. I don't know that much to be telling no stories Why about him. Not? I, all, all, all I know is, is he's a, a very uh, influential person, a person who knew a lot. I mean, I 
follow some of those, uh, uh, listen to him and mm -hmm. try to uh, Google or research some of the stuff he was saying. They, she said some at some university had a uh, department of hospitality or carriage or something like that. And I, I call they did have one, mm -hmm. you know. So sometimes you know it's it's way out there, you you know, but it sounds like it's right, <laughs> uh, true, but. He, he was a very interesting person. Very Being a comedian, how important is it to gain knowledge? Because I realize a lot of these comedians, not all, um, tend to do a lot of research and impart knowledge onto people, not just to be funny. Well, if they, if they like what I was trying to find, you're trying to get to the bottom of the truth and what life is, is and what life is all about. And the better way you can find it really is through comedy because you'll be able to say some things that you normally wouldn't be able to say. You can experience certain things you normally wouldn't be able to experience because it's, uh, you're, being curio you're being curious. Mm -hmm. You want to know why. Why I got to do this? Why I got to do that? Why is this such and like this? And so... And just pass it off as comedy, although that's Yeah, you can pass it off as comedy, but, in the, but it's the way of you can say it because you can get away with a lot of stuff with comedy. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes comedy even got brutal, got too direct, too personal, you know, but a lot of stuff you can just say it in comedy and you can learn from it, uh, impart it, you can keep it, you can retain it through comedy faster than it. you can through. And let me right. ask you about uh, this, I, I have a rapper, he on the wall about three, four times, O.T.I. He switches over into comedy, and but he was in the music first. Had you ever seen that before, where a person come from doing music? Into comedy, whether it was well, R&B. T.P. Hearns was a singer, and he he did comedy. You okay. know, a lot. Of, uh, uh, T.I. had his own fan base, mm -hmm. so therefore he really didn't step over nobody or behind nobody because he had his own fan base. You know what I'm saying? So he can go out there. You know, you can go out there and bomb, do what you want to do, and experiment because you got your fan base. It ain't like it ain't like a, a com comedian that's trying to come up. He's a person who wanted to give it a shot, like almost like a bucket list or whatever you want to do. Right. So he went out there and tried to do it. But he found out to it, there's more to it than, than just getting on that stage. Mm -hmm. You know, there's just more to it than that, you know. Wow. I got a friend, uh, one of my friends, I ain't going to really give his name out or nothing, but he know who he is, you know. Um, these jokes, man. Have anybody, you, I know you say Quincy took something of yours and started using it. Um, a joke. If you see a joke on stage, or if somebody see you do a joke, have you ever had to experience somebody, somebody steal your stealing joke? Your somebody joke? did do my joke. One did a joke right in front of me at the at the uh, uh, at the hip hop comedy uh, club. He what, did right. What, who did right in front of me? Right in front of me. When we was coming up, he did right in front. But 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 <laughs> who did he say? <laughs> he didn't say. Who. I didn't say who it okay. was. Okay, he's not gonna say. But who. Uh, uh, he did. He did. But you know. But you get influenced by. Uh, uh, comedians and, and, and you get so you might if you got a favorite comedian you might take a little from that uh, comedian but what you can't steal from a comedian is personality see when you do a person when you steal it I feel, when, when I feel like a person is stealing they're stealing a the personality mm -hmm. they're saying the same they're, they're doing the joke the uh, mannerism and everything but look I'm gonna, I'm gonna say this and I always say this it's not the material that make you big it's not the material Every preacher got the same material. Same book. Why is one preacher bigger than the other preacher? They got the same material. It's either the organization around you or your personality. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. That's what it is. And that's entertainment. That's life in period. Yeah. Everybody can say, you stole my joke. You know? but man, it's, you ain't, I, there's so many words in a dictionary. You steal a whole dictionary? <laughs> you stole my joke. Let me, um, and I agree with you because, like I said, I see these uh, comedians, like I said, a lot of them are delivering. Are you ever going to get in the internet side and give us some stuff I've on your page? I've been doing, I've been. Are I'm, you on Facebook for, for I'm, all, I'm, the, all I'm, the time? I'm, I'm doing, I'm, I can't do it as much. I, 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 I try to do it, but man, it's a lot of work. <laughs> it, it is, is right. It is. I got this. You know, I need you know a, it's a bag I, over there. I need, I need a assistant. W2. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bag over I there. I know it's a bag over there. You can do it. I mean, I said I got a I got a CD that I did back in 96, 97. Mm -hmm. I would talked about the internet. I talked about the internet before it even blew up. Mm 
Really? Yeah, I, talk, I told him you can make money with it. I I I I, 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 I could give you one of them CDs. It, it's on my it's on my thing. You had already I, talked. I, I already about talked it. about it. I already knew about it. I mean, I, but I, you ain't jumped in there. I didn't jump in there. I, I, I had a whole book on. I should have jumped in it when I had this book to go through the whole thing of it. But sometimes I'm afraid to be too too popular where you can't go nowhere. That's mm -hmm. it. You can't go nowhere. You can't. You can't eat. You can't. You know, sometimes celebrity is good. I'm so I'm glad I'm a like a borderline. People know me now. They begin to oh that's Chuck Ducky. That's Chuck Ducky. But, but I can sit down and talk to the regular people. Boss Talk finna put that eyesight on you. I can tell you that right no, now. No, he put no eyesight. Chuck Ducky. Boss Talk finna make you yeah. get right over Man, here. But I I because I, I love Man, like I've been looking for Chuck Ducky. I love yeah. talking to I love talking to everyday people. Yeah, me too. And I like to be just be uh, be just the home home bar with you. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to be so big. I'm way up here. You can't talk to me. I, I mean, as long as I can take care of my bills. And I can do what I want to do and still travel. I don't travel. I don't travel, man. I've been to Italy, Japan, Spain, uh, Japan, Japan, Germany. Oh, yeah, I done yeah, been. Boy. I done been though. I done been. I done toured uh, the United States about forty times with the circus, with stand up comedy, with gospel plays. Let me ask you. I that. done been. And you know, I've been sitting down here calculating. I'm like, okay, he had his child when he was twenty something in seventy nine, and then he said he was. I'm like. You don't. I know the gray hair. I don't look at the gray hair, but I look at your skin. Mm -hmm. You look young. Look good. I look you young. Look, you, you look, look good, good. man. Because well, I'm have, 67. If you want to know, know what you're I'm 67. I calculated well, well, around I'm, that, I'm, but I'm, you I'm look six, six and a half. <laughs> <laughs> six, six and a half. But yeah. you look good. When you when you sitting at the house or sitting somewhere and you hear Mike Epps say what he said about uh, Chris Rock. Doing this and and it causing your, or, or was it Steve Harvey? No, what, was, what? It, was Chris. it was Chris Rock. Was, I mean, that was, was Mike. Mike said, said, said that. Mike said okay, that. but what, what do you it, you like? Dang, this internet it ain't gonna let me. Uh, it ain't gonna now, let yeah, me duck I, off. I, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, I'm trying to duck off. Yeah, <laughs> I'm trying to duck off. Uh, even even uh, Kevin Hart said when <laughs> Kevin Hart. When Kevin Hart and Mike Epps was in uh, having a battle back in yeah. the time, and uh, Kevin Hart say, "I do stadiums and I do such such," he told Mike Epps he do uh, 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 clubs and, and theaters or whatever. You know, he say, uh, 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 "Get on your level." He just say like Shucky Ducky or something like that. He says, I say, I, I say, what, what did I get into? Why are they come telling me? You know, cause you know, cause I had blew up. That right. name blew up, and they think I should be bigger than what I mm, really yeah. was. Mm -hmm. You know, but you know, I'm I'm not hung up on. It. I did my thing. Did I made Shucky Ducky a household word. That's what your aim was. Yeah, I mean, I know what my lane is. Exactly. And I think that's I think that's dope to have. I, I know all, my lane. All you saying is I have self awareness. I need a battery. That's oh yeah. All people like me who never knew who you are. I tell people every time they sit in that seat, mm -hmm. people can hear your music or see your entertainment, comedy, yep. comedy, whatever, and they love it, but I think people fall more in love with you when As they person. find out who you are and the struggles that you had to go through and what, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I think that's the, I think that's the antidote. I think that's what people are missing, that in this day and time, because of digital media and digital, you know, the way people are doing things now, they want to hear more about you and see you more. Mm -hmm. And it also builds your brand and your and your worth, you know. I had a guy come on here and said that once he left his show, his money went way up because people were looking Goody. for him. Oh, you the tonight show. No, no, no. Johnny Carson. <laughs> no, you the Johnny Carson. Something, like something like that. Something like that. Yeah, no, 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 I think it's just people seeing because you. Because he was missing in action for a long time and him. nobody hadn't seen him. And once he and came he back out he like said, that, he said, hooked him people up. People started calling him. That's just one oh, yeah. case. Hey, every damn body ain't said that, Shuggy Duggy. Hey, I'm so I ain't doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we ain't I, there yet. Not yet, but I just I value the. No, fact. you got a, you got a, a, a. I saw, I've seen several of your podcasts, and it was good. Uh, that's good because you know I was trying to get in touch with somebody, and I gave you a call. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, but uh, I enjoyed uh, that. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, but I've seen it. It, it looks good. Thanks, thank man. You. We show, we, we show trying to bring it home, huh? Yes, yeah, sir. Man, thank you, uh, Shuggy Duck. How can people get a hold to you if they trying to check out your Facebook, your Instagram, or just where you going to be at? Well, i tell you all this. Be patient with me because, uh, you know, I'm still on the itch and sketch uh, type of a uh, thing. But, uh, no, you got the real Shucky Ducky is the real 
Shucky Ducky on Facebook. You got you got me Shucky Ducky on Facebook, the real Shucky Ducky on Instagram and uh, email. TikTok and email. I, I got a you don't my email emails. is full, man. I had a Yahoo account, <laughs> I had an AOL account. That uh, you know that's old. When you got the AOL. AOL, AOL account. Oh, no, I, Hotmail is old. Oh, we well, Hotmail. Hot I, I, <laughs> well, I had a Yahoo account and it filled up, and then I got me a Google account that filled up, man. Mm. Oh, and then you don't be checking it. Maybe I'll, I'll be spammed and, and all delete. That. You need to delete them. I get tired of deleting. <laughs> I got about oh, forty thousand emails. I need to delete every last. But I'm scared to delete everything. I, I'm gonna I'm delete everything. Man, start all over again. So, man, I I, I want to say thank you for coming on Boss thank Talk One on One, man. Well, thank you for having me. We love you. We appreciate you, bro. And he's he brought up Tom John. I seen Tom John at the strip club by. Five six years ago, I ain't seen him. Where is he? Oh, at? You did, don't be. Oh, you did. Like, tell <laughs> what him, is that? Why you got to just throw that all out there? Well, I don't I be curious. Where, uh, Have Tom you John seen him? I ain't, no. And we looking for Tom John over here oh, at Boss you wanna Talk One. I want to interview Tom John over here at Boss Talk One. Well, don't be using me to come try to get to no, Tom no. John. I know, I know you know Shucky Ducky. I don't know him. Man. <laughs> I don't know that. Everybody you to talk. I don't know people that well. I ain't always in their business. Well, the one thing about it, if if they spoke your name or something like that, or if you said you've been around. Them, or if they just putting their name and you, your name everywhere. I knew your name. I used to be like, damn, that's Shucky Ducky. You know, it's just the name and the way you presented it that made people really remember you, man. It's real catchy. Yeah, and, 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 and I think that's dope that we got the story. Right. And it's like, it's like every time you say Shucky Ducky now, it's like you, you have quack, to say quack, quack. quack. <laughs> Shucky Ducky, quack, quack. Hey, man. And I, and you know what I say, man? Quack, quack back. <laughs> man, check it, man. It's been another great segment. A Boss Talk 101, where the bosses talk. And we out.